This is a production of Cornell University. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, most of the time I'm talking to uh, audience, uh, audiences of artists, um, which is one kind of talk and one kind of audience. Um, but a lot of what I do is really meant to be bridging and translating vocabularies between different disciplines uh, and addressing over-specialization um, when we have complex problems uh, to address and complex systems uh, to, to deal with. So uh, as Johannes mentioned, um, I was a faculty member for about 15 years at a number of different art schools. Um, and my work as an artist kept moving me closer and closer to what I could only understand as research. Um, and there was no vocabulary in the art world for conducting research uh, by making artwork. Um, and so I, I left and became what I've been told is now an independent scholar, which meant I needed an organization um, to back me up, and I invented one. Um, and so what I do um, is um, I work with artists to recognize that their process of making art is a form of research. Um, and that research uh, that scientists or other artists or other disciplines may do um, is also uh, producing art, um, that they are related to each other in a really important way. So I'm going to fly through a bunch of material as quickly as I can so that um, we can have a conversation about it because I'm particularly interested in what kind of questions you may have and how you may see your own relationship. Um, to the kinds of learning and the, the ways of knowing that artists use. Um, so uh, the first question may be, um, that you're all asking, um, and I'm often asked, is what is it that artists actually do? Uh, does anyone have a, a quick pithy answer about what artists do? Sometimes it's like, what do you do? I'm an artist. And they're like, okay. I don't know what that is, but that's a good answer. Yeah. Observe the world, create an interpretation of it, right? So you're a step ahead. You're already like recognizing that the observation, that's the big part, right? A lot of people say, well, what do you do? You make artists make art, right? It's like they, they look at the interpretation, they look at the object that artists are producing as the result of being an artist. Um, so it might be easier to comprehend if I ask you, what do scientists do? Um, would anyone in this room say, oh, we make science, <laughs> right? So there's a much better vocabulary, I, I think at least, um, in the sciences for what it is that scientists do because there's, there are systems, there are methods, that's basically, you know, science is understood as a, a means of learning about the world. Um, there are structures through which you, you stage your learning. Um, and the fact is that art actually is the same thing. So. Uh, even scientists also use the similar vocabulary to artists, right? How do you know if you've, what you've done is useful? Um, in science, the thing works. Um, in art, we talk about the same thing. An artwork works. Like, we can't necessarily describe why because we haven't built up that vocabulary. That's a part of the problem that I'm trying to address among artists. But um, we recognize that something works. Um, and so I see artists and scientists as essentially cousins, right? We're related to each other. Um, and we're related around this idea that what we do is we learn about the world. Um, we produce knowledge um, about the world around and within us. So this is um, a, a super loaded slide with tons and tons of historical implications that you can take a snapshot of and email me about later. Um, but this is kind of a rough map I drew up of uh, the creation of knowledge and understanding, particularly in the West. Um, where once scientists and artists were the same thing, we were natural philosophers, right? We observed the world around us, we tried to make sense of it. Um, then the enlightenment came, the empirical method came, um, and scientists became scientists. Um, and no offense, but at the time, the science wasn't very good, right? The method was good, but, the, but it was still very crude. Um, the result of that was that artists um, became romantics. They looked at what scientists were doing, trying to break the world apart and understand its constituent pieces. And artists said, what about the ineffable? What about spirit? What about soul? What about faith, right? 
And so art and religion became bound together in this idea of um, romance, um, and that was romanticism, what I've called art religion. Um, and then with modernism, art and religion had its own schism. And so here we see like a kind of disciplinary or sort of knowledge production um, categorization, specialization. <coughs> um, so the thing is that we, um, so scientists could collect data, right? Like that is the, the empirical method. You observe, you experiment, and you gather data, and then you synthesize that data and make sense of it. Um, so artists do the same thing, but we don't have a vocabulary for it. So in art school, we don't recognize what kind of knowledge we're producing. We just create the objects. Um, and so what artists produce, this is what artists are taught. We are taught to make art, okay? We bring it into class and we critique it. Um, so what I do with the Artist Literacy Institute is I bring together artists at all stages of their career um, and do these interdisciplinary workshops. I work with artists one-on-one -on -one, and I keep asking the same question over and over again. What do you know and how do you know it? So if I ask an artist that, that can be very challenging for a lot of artists. Um, I just have a hunch. I can feel it. I can sense it, right? I use my intuition. Um, so I call these things artist literacies. Um, and I'll point that out and uh, why, why it is a literacy in a moment. Um, but in artist literacy, uh, they are our senses. They are our sensitivities. They are our ways of knowing. Um, so every artist, I believe, may have different ways of knowing. Um, and I suspect that our artistic disciplines our media are different ways of learning that we've selected and reflect the possession of unique literacies, unique ways of knowing about the world. Um, so the reason it's a literacy is because a literacy has to go in two directions. If you can just read, but you can't write, you aren't fully literate. If you can write, but you can't read, you aren't fully literate. And a literacy doesn't necessarily have to uh, deal with only words. Um, so most of the, everyone in the room is almost um, an environmental scientist, a scientist of some kind. Um, so I don't know anything about environmental science. You know, that's, that's like, I come in just not knowing and, and that's all right. Um, so I don't know anything about it. Um, I don't know what you know and I don't know how you know it. I don't know about your methods. I can come to school here. I would probably learn a lot. Um, but as a filmmaker, if I spent a few weeks here among you, with a camera and spoke with you and observed <laughs> you and talked with you and watched, um, I would start to learn a lot about environmental science. I would learn it the way that I learn, which is um, I tell stories. I make narrative and causative connections between things. Um, and the thing that might surprise you is that in practice, in doing this, I may actually learn things about environmental science and environmental scientists that you yourselves don't know. Um, so having that observer present, right, is, um, can be a really very powerful thing. Um, there are new things that we can learn. Um, and that's because I have what I call a, a literacy in narrative. Um, narrative itself, I would define as perceived causation. When you go and watch a movie, these different clips of footage are stuck together and they make sense to you because you perceive causation between those clips. That's the mental and cognitive process that we <coughs> sit in an editing room and spend months poring over. Does cut A make sense with cut B? Um, if we think that an audience would recognize causation between A and B, then there's a narrative connection. The same thing happens if I'm just sitting here with a camera and I'm looking around the room. I'm making kind of very quick, rapid, I'm, I'm reading, right? Using my literacy, I'm reading I'm saying something, people are responding in a certain way. And I'm looking around and I'm making narrative connections. And so this is a way of knowing. Um, they don't teach that in film school though. <laughs> uh, so perceived causation, um, and this is a, a, a model project where I was testing this uh, in Uganda, actually trying to understand um, why uh, elephant and ivory bearing animal populations were declining in some places and rising in others. Um, I went in looking through the lens of perceived causation, also known as narrative. If we can tell a story about why certain systems are working better than other systems, maybe we can understand something causative about it. Um, and this was a real puzzle because um, across Africa, certain parts of uh, East Africa were seeing elephant populations rise and certain parts were seeing them fall. And yet the same 
interventions were being applied in both of those places. So there was something different in one context as opposed to another one, and they didn't know what it was. And I said, wait, maybe if we told a story about it, uh, we, might be able to un we might be able to see something we couldn't see. Um, so this is a kind of visualization of what that cognitive process to a filmmaker looks like. When I look at a film frame, okay, I don't actually see these squares, but these squares represent a way of looking for a filmmaker. That is, within a single image, there is a ton of material, a ton of, of uh, visual information that I'm able to read, and, I'm and I also know that my audience is going to read. Now, my audience, again, sad to say, is probably mostly illiterate, mostly visually illiterate, because we don't teach visual literacy the way we teach verbal and, and uh, textual literacy. Um, but you will look at an image and you will start to make very quick evaluations about people, context, tone, mood, emotion, because you're human beings, right? Because you see that thing, you can perceive these things. Um, this is the difference between being able to watch a film and being able to make a film. Anyone in the room can watch a film. It does take a lot of work and training to be able to make a film. So this is within one film frame, okay? And there are three categories of knowledge in that film frame. Then the next film, then the next cut comes along and there's three more categories of knowledge and they speak to each other. So there's not only uh, intramural or intraframe information, but there's also interframe information. And it very quickly multiplies and a film becomes a really complex site of of knowing, right? Cognitive and subconscious knowing. Most of the time, you get to see that knowledge in the form of a continuous stream of scenes, a film. Um, and I started to wonder what it would look like if it wasn't all in a line, but if we were able to hop around the media based on things like decisions that got made, behaviors. Um, and so this is a map of narrative linkages between different scenes <coughs> in the film. Um, that conceivably we could follow and learn different things about the characters in the film, the people um, who are living these experiences. Um, so all of this is a kind of what we call coding, right? Um, you know, we're doing it in an editing room. Most filmmakers are not doing it consciously. It's a lot of just dialogue and discourse in the editing room. Does this work? Does this not work? You iterate, you try it again and again, you show people rough cuts, right? So it's a very, again, kind of scientific method of just like, yeah, it's there, it's almost there, it doesn't quite work, and then, um, and then you end up with the product. But we only get known for our product. So that's how it works for a filmmaker. Um, and then I started to wonder, well, what about other forms of art making? What about other creative practices? Uh, besides narrative, what are these other kinds of literacies that might be out there? Um, and I was actually just, um, uh, just the other day, actually, at this Hans Hock uh, show at the New Museum. And, um, you know, this is a really interesting uh, artist in the sense that he's been doing these kinds of investigations in things like these natural phenomena um, for a long time. Um, this mound of dirt, one of, an early earthwork. Um, what happens if I put a pile of dirt and a bunch of grass seed in, a, in an art gallery? the grass grows. Um, he is also a detective. Um, so in the 1960s, he uncovered um, an enormous real estate scheme in New York City. Um, and in fact, the Guggenheim wouldn't exhibit it because um, he said, this isn't art, right? This is like police work, real estate work. Um, now, Hans Hock is being displayed in the, in the new museum. So what are the outcomes of that, right? Now it's being consumed as entertainment. Um, and this is, again, because of the structures of the art world, is that people can only recognize the finished product. But the fact is that Hans Hock learned things nobody else could knew, right? Um, and there was no mechanism for him as an artist to bring that learning to the world. He could bring it to a journalist, right? He could bring it to scientists, but those connections didn't exist. Um, I imagine you might look at something like grass grows and all kinds of ideas come to mind, right? What's the content of the soil? What kind of grass is it? You know, like, but, um, what is the light, the temperature? All of these things. Um, you have literacies that Hans Hock didn't. He is just trying something out, um, but he's, he's this investigator. Um, so the question is, what are the kinds of data that are being crunched when an artist is producing their work? Um, 
right? Instead of, uh, you know, what we make as just art, um, there's also something important, which is our process. How do we get to that point? So I'm calling these primary texts and producer texts because if I call them texts, <coughs> texts can be coded, texts can be analyzed and interpreted. Um, so artists produce art, that's true, but in a much bigger way, we spend most of our time in our process, right? Sketching, um, thinking, making memos, making notes, <laughs> um, and, and we end up with lots and lots of texts that tend to go unanalyzed. Artists are ta taught to hide that stuff away, right? Don't, you can't put that in the gallery, that's not, part, that's not our finished product. Um, and then something else that art produces, of course, is its effect on people in a much bigger way. Um, lots of people will watch a film and things are happening uh, in the, the sensibilities and in the hearts of the people who experience that film. Um, as uh, Johannes mentioned that I also work as an impact producer, right? So this is a made up job um, that people invented about 10 years ago, um, speci specifically around social issue documentaries, which is how do you make a film and then contextualize it so that it can create social change. Um, I don't, like the, I don't like the framework of impact, partly because it's, it's a little colonial. The idea that like, I'm a fast moving object and I can impact another community or society with, with my artwork. Um, I prefer engagement, but impact producer is the term. There are companies that do this um, for films. They take your film, they contextualize it, they survey their audiences, um, they do social science around how people perceive the subject, uh, and then they try and build agendas and engagement campaigns, sometimes to create policy change and address legislators, or sometimes to create community change or educational programs. But the point is that the, the film is no longer the end product, right? The impact now is the product. Um, so you make an artwork, it has an effect on audiences, and whether we like it to or not, it has an, those audiences then have an effect on our process. Okay, so I'm gonna listen to people at my show, I'm gonna to listen to people who have talked about my previous work and that's gonna inform the process and create this cycle. Um, my previous art is also going to inform my process. My process is also going to then uh, touch on the audiences. And so this is the churn of the artistic process. The art itself is a very small part of it. And what I'm interested in is what kind of data exists um, in these effect bubbles in this process bubble. How can we code that and how can we see um, the knowledge that's being produced there? So for all kinds of artists, um, there are uh, these kinds of texts. Um, this is what I call a knowledge engine, right? An artist is uh, basically a driver of a knowledge engine. Um, but the artists all, can't all by themselves capture all that knowledge. There's much too much in there. Um, so, I'm working with actors um, who have recognized that their literacy in being able to embody um, and verbatim perform real living people um, are a knowledge engine for audiences to identify implicit biases and how their political preferences are actually shaped um, in a spectacle environment. Uh, so Lindsey Graham, when embodied by a female actor, people perceive this person very differently and recognize that their political preferences are not necessarily all their own. They have deep structural implicit biases that are affecting those things. Lindsey Graham gets away with things that this actor cannot. Um, audiences respond very different ways. Um, with the same group of actors, we're now doing this for um, the democratic primaries um, by body, gender, and race swapping all the democratic candidates. We're testing people um, and their own perceptions of their political preferences. Um, and these are really, really surprising. The fact is, as I said, we go in not knowing. Um, and we aren't there to tell people who to vote for, but what we do find out is that we're at, people don't actually know why they prefer the people, that, the candidates that they do. So there's, their prefer preferences are being shaped by a lot of factors that they're not <laughs> conscious of. And so what this does is it allows us uh, to get them to, to see and think more critically. And I think this is really important um, in terms of resilience. Uh, you know, we live in a democracy that is driven by spectacle and therefore our choices are not really our own if we are not critical and conscious of the spectacle. Uh, so I'm working with a sculptor um, who is interested in studying social dynamics as form. 
Um, and uh, here we are, um, again, this is a choreographer looking for um, methods and the qualitative data in what we call applied choreography. What does her familiarity with um, body kinetics and the movement of an organism have to do with, um, she's both a choreographer and a demographer for the city of New York. So she also studies the movement of populations, the, the changes of community, uh, changes of neighborhoods. Um, and what we're trying to do is build a bridge between those two ways of knowing. Um, so each of these experiences, performances, um, choreographies, sculptures, any artwork, any photograph, any film can be coded, right? We can code those and we can code all of the producer texts that are made in the meantime as well. And from that, there's data, right? That's the information. That's the, but they might be data types that we don't recognize. Um, importantly, data is not knowledge. So it's not enough just to kind of gather the data, but we also have to synthesize it. Um, so knowledge exists only within a consciousness. Um, data can exist outside of the world all, all on its own, right? We need, conscious, we need a conscience or consciousness um, to recognize knowledge. Um, and so I was wondering, you know, do artists just go out and gather information without recognizing that it's information and then skip ahead to synthesizing into artworks? Um, and vice versa, um, and I don't know, you know, to what extent is synthesis within science um, not acknowledging certain kinds of data types, not acknowledging um, or recognizing even the presence of kinds of knowing, um, either within the scientists themselves or within the, the, the systems that they're working with. Um, and so I feel like we need each other. Um, so artists, when they get around scientists, start get really excited. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed that. Um, we, we recognize all these opportunities for synthesis. Like, oh my God, did you, I, I could make something out of this, right? I could make a project out of this. I, what you guys are doing is really interesting to me. Um, I don't understand it, but I want to synthesize it, right? That's like the artistic drive. Whereas, you know, think about Hans Hock or any of these other projects. Um, you as scientists might look at it and be like, oh my God, there's so much data in there, right? We should draw some of that data out. We should draw some of that information out. And I feel like there is a symbiosis there that we are kind of lacking. Um, so, you know, a prominent and really pertinent example of this right now, um, you know, in addressing this is the most pressing issue of our time, um, you know, how can research and intervention through artist literacies be a meaningful component of our response? Uh, scientists have presented all the evidence necessary to demonstrate that this is happening, and yet there's no movement, or very little movement, or it's just painfully, painfully so. Um, so it isn't necessarily a question of resources, of where the carbon is, of, 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 of uh, what the temperature is, um, but it's a question of relationships. Um, what is our relationship to the earth, to the environment, right? What are human beings' relationships to one another? Um, the earth will be fine. It will get rid of us if it needs to. We won't, right? What we have to do is we have to recognize our relationship to the earth, um, and that's something that, art, that can really empower artists. Okay, a lot of artists that I talk to around this issue feel disempowered because they feel like it's a scientific issue. Scientists I talk to feel disempowered because they're like, look, we put the evidence out there, right? This is happening. We know it's happening. But somehow the, our relationship to the information, to the knowledge, just doesn't seem to, to actually create any traction. So again, I feel like this is where this is not one or the other. We have to supplement and complement one another's work. Um, this is the part of the talk where artists, audi audiences of artists, rather, start to ask me about instrumentalization and they get worried. Right? Artists don't want to be instrumentalized. Um, sometimes it's okay to be instrumentalized because, you know, we, we, do, we, we can be tools. Um, but also, artists have this sense left over from that previous uh, map of our romantic past um, that we're a little bit outside of things and that we're a little bit Maybe we're special, you know, that, that it's ineffable. Um, the things that we do can't be touched, that they're innately human. And these are important ideas, right? Because everything that we do, I don't think can be quantified. Um, so are we instrumentalizing or are we identifying new value in the poetic and the ineffable and the effective? 
uh, and this is an important thing to maintain. Kinds of instrumentalization uh, that you may see in art, um, and again, these are not necessarily negative things, but these do compartmentalize art, right? Um, stem to steam, I don't know how familiar you are with, with the stem to steam movement, but um, it, you know, it's looking at the, the STEM emphasis um, in spe especially American high schools and saying, well, you're leaving out something really important there. Um, the, 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 the crisis, I would say, in STEM to STEAM is that nobody actually knows what the A for art is actually supposed to be doing there, right? So it's science, technology, engineering, and math with A jammed in there. And often what artists get, get pigeonholed into doing is this third thing, data visualization, and communications. So you guys gather the data and you're like, can you make us a nice chart or design our website for us? Um, and that's like the only economic value artists feel like they have, right, is the product of our, uh, the product of our process. Activism is another one. There's nothing wrong with activism, but it is a compartmentalization of what artists are actually capable of, right? The reason artists have gotten to the point of activism is because we know things. How did we come to learn those things? Um, human-centered design, and then of course, con the contemporary art market, which is you know, um, maybe not uh, fully familiar here, but uh, a super insidious problem. It is the wealth farm um, for the world's richest people. Um, there are only two things that actually generate wealth, generate money from nothingness. Um, it is contemporary art and real estate. Um, contemporary art is just you know, money from thin air. Um, it's speculation and it drives um, economies. And artists are caught in this trap of making work, striving to get into a gallery, striving to gain a reputation, striving to become a brand, striving to be collected. And then you're being collected by, frankly, the people who are creating uh, some of the most significant problems in the world right now. So, um, Expanding on these instrument and instrumentalizations, right, is important. Each of these has to be pushed beyond. Um, and that's done by coming back and recognizing that, you know, it is the, the value um, that artists bring is not necessarily in the artwork, but it is in this process, right? It is in our way of learning, in our way of knowing. Um, and trying to figure out how um, we can value the process of art making the same way we value the process of science. As scientists, if you just tell me that you're going to spend the next three, four, five, or 10 years conducting research, nobody has a problem with that. It's totally normal. If I do that as an artist, well, that's not economically sustainable, and we don't know what research looks like. Right? So as artists, we have work to do um, to educate ourselves about what art-based art research looks like, and how do we integrate it with other forms of research so that other researchers can recognize what we do and see the value in it. That was quick, it was a lot. But now I wanna hear from you, take questions. Uh, I can skip back to any slides, but uh, please let me, let me have it. Yeah. You mentioned that some scientists don't have understanding of the uh, understanding of the mission. Like sensitizing information, could you give examples of that? Well, you're talking about like artists versus scientists and how you understand. Yeah. Um, it was, a, it was really a question, right? I think you know, my understanding of art is that it is, it is leaping ahead to synthesis um, because we don't have a lot of vocabulary for data, right? We don't have a lot of vocabulary for information. Um, whereas, I mean, I, I, I did a lot of work with USAID and I've done a lot of work with organizations that rely on scientific data, um, but haven't synthesized it. Like, we don't know what this means. We just have the data. And that's a particularly like a big data approach, you know. Um, I think there's a trend away from that, which I'm hopeful for, but that's what I mean. You know, it's the sense of just like, is it enough to just show us a map or a giant set of data, you know, data points without synthesizing, well, what is the meaning of it? Um, and that often is when scientists and art do come back to artists, is can you help me synthesize this? Can you help me visualize it? Can you help me understand it? And I think, you know, that's something that, we can definitely do, and then complement each other. You're talking about how one of your works had to do um, with like looking, finding like a narrative of like what's happening with elephant populations. Did you um, 
come to any sort of conclusion or possibility? Yeah, we actually only, we did about a three day survey. It was super quick because I, I, um, I was sent there for, and, and this is how artists often get a wedge in, a foothold in. I was sent there to make a film for USAID about something else in Uganda. And I said, can I have three extra days and model this, this mode of research for a problem that you guys have and don't have a solution for? And so they connected me with the African Wildlife Foundation and said, sure, if you can figure out why Uganda um, is seeing rising elephant populations, the elephant population in Uganda has skyrocketed <coughs> since the civil war there. Meanwhile, in Tanzania, it is continuing to plummet. It's still poaching. Um, and, and yet the interventions, like the government interventions and the community interventions are kind of the same. Um, so something's happening in Uganda that's not happening in Tanzania. So we didn't get to do a comparative study in Tanzania. We did a kind of preliminary study, um, you know, on a few days of just talking with rangers, observing them, following them through their work processes, and then coding the footage and evaluating the footage on a narrative lens. And again, I didn't know what they didn't know. So I just gave them a report back and said, you know, the things that's amazing about these rangers is that they're really patriotic. They come from all over Uganda. And when they join um, the, uh, the Uganda Wildlife uh, Authority, um, that's like joining the military in, in the United States, right? So they describe their patriotism, right? Defending their natural resources, protecting their country's identity. And um, I was like that, you know, we we're kind of like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> like, that's a great thing. And uh, the UWA um, and the uh, AWF, uh, no, not AWF, uh, based in the US, not the Wildlife Preservation Society, but the other organization that we were working for, had never heard of this. They didn't know, they didn't realize patriotism was important. So in Uganda, right, I mean, people are coming from their, their villages and from their communities, and there is, you know, there's a lot of this kind of like, kind of fractured national identity. Um, and come, they were uniting around Uganda's natural resources, its wildlife. Um, and suddenly they realized, oh, this is a way we can recruit rangers, right? That, and that's one of the biggest things. They just need more rangers. They just need more people who are out there protecting the animals. Um, and recruitment is an issue. And they said, well, we should recruit on patriotism. We should recruit and do it for Uganda, right? The way that we recruit soldiers, right? It's, 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 you see it everywhere. I mean, you know, there's so much kind of militarism in America and so much patriotism that unites us as a country. Uganda has found that you, they can unite themselves as a country around defending their, their wildlife. Yeah. Yes. So I work um, actually for the Elephant Listening Project at the Lab of Ho, and one of the things I do is I make videos of the week to like do this public outreach. Oh yeah. Um, are there some tips or anything that you could like give to those who want to like increase their visual literacy? In the terms of me, it's not necessarily people. It's like looking at videos of elephants and being like, oh, these match. Like this is the same behavior. Mm -hmm. But like which is a little easier when you understand those. But like for people, I know that you said like there's differences unless you do it, so. Yeah, so doing it is the best way yeah. to do it, right? It, doing it is the best way to learn. You, you develop literacy by trying to read. Um, so you develop visual literacy by trying to look. Okay. Um, and, but that, that key question I would keep coming back to is what do you know and how do you know it? So when you look at an image, when you look at a moving image, ask yourself like, what do I know about this image? Um, and then where did that knowledge come from, right? Um, I mean, if I, you know, just kind of skip quickly to a slide like this, right, you can look at a slide like that and be like, all right, it's three people sitting in a row, but what do I know about it, okay? I know there's an authority figure, right? I can recognize age difference. I can recognize some sort of context. It's an institutional context. We can tell that by the lighting. Um, we look at people's facial expressions. Like, here's how I know what's happening in this scene, right? This is the story that's unfolding. And then when you, when you basically split this up into categories of knowledge, you're like, oh, all right. I, so now I know how to make an image that can tell the story I want to tell. Uh, I mean, the, you know, the, the biggest kind of um, failure in visual literacy that, you've, that you would see when you see a film is like, well, that didn't make any sense, right? Because the audience interpreted it one way 
and the filmmakers intended it another. Um, and so that's just a matter of you know, using the wrong image, right? Using the wrong shot, using the wrong angle, and recognizing as you would that you know, every single detail matters. What is the camera angle? What is the lighting? How clear is the sound? All of those things are components in our understanding. That's a great question. The ideal relationship between artists and scientists, um, this is what we were talking about this morning, it's adjacency. I think it's just, you know, there's a school of science and there's a school of art, and how often do you see each other, right? How often do you just sit next to each other and just kind of, you know, cross-pollinate? Um, Partly, those artists and those scientists have to be kind of armed with an openness. Um, right? When you look at an artwork, to say like, hey, this is full of data, which would be great. And an artist would be like, there is? It is? Great. What is it? What is the data? Help me, right? And so that's the adjacency, right? So there should be artist studios right there, and they should be there. It should be a playground in a sandbox. That's what artist studios are, right? It's just, we just play and test and experiment. And then you can walk in and be like, hey, what are you up to? That's it. So it doesn't, I don't, so this is where I don't, we don't need to instrumentalize artists and have them embedded as residents and do science because no, we're not going to be good at that, right? But we could just be there and you can see in our work what you see and we can see in your work what we see and we can work together uh, going forward. What would you see if the relationship Every studio is renaming itself a lab now. Yeah. <laughs> Because exactly for this reason, I think, um, you know, a lab has a sense, I think there's a technological overtone to a lab, right, that, we're, that isn't in a studio. And as artists start to adopt technologies, their studios become labs. Um, in terms of places for experimentation, play, testing, and observation, I feel like they're the same. Do, do we need a science does it exist and what would it do? That's a good question. What do you know and how do you know it? Um, I think, I mean, I think that science, I'm going to totally put my foot in my mouth here. I just, yeah. Um, my understanding of science is that it's a much more kind of structured way of learning, right? Um, there are steps in the process and there is peer review and there is kind of mutual recognition of what's good science and what's bad science. Um, it doesn't always work, you know, and I think that's, you know, sometimes it comes down to the tools, sometimes it comes down to the people. Um, but I think that where science literacy is, would be valuable is, um, is understanding also the, the, the human presence in science, um, right? What, again, everyone in this room is full of implicit biases and, and structural prejudices that are not necessarily bad things, they are just present. All right, I'm a white man born and raised in the United States. I, that, that is a loaded thing to be, right? And there is a lot in there that as you kind of work through it and grow through it and recognize those biases, you're like, oh my gosh, I haven't made a free choice in my life, you know? It's like, we aren't really free of those things. And so I think for scientists, that's a huge challenge because you're trying to create this objective view of the world and just see it for its data points. But it's so hard to see data points outside of our own head, you know, and, and I, don't, I don't necessarily buy into objectivity so much as what I call multiple subjectivity. We need, we need multiple truths, right, to inform a common, a common reality. Yeah. What's your take on the relation between you know, the literacy, literacy of the arts and sciences where, like, philosophy and epistemology, which would like question the objective observations of science. Yeah, it's related. I, you know, this question that I, that I keep coming back to of what do you know and, and how do you know it, you know, is, is philosophy, is epistemology. Um, and I'm also not a philosopher, right? So um, I couldn't tell you who got there first um, or the history of it. Um, it comes more from this recognition that uh, so much of what we're trying to do as people um, is, is based on a faith in objectivity, right? A belief that there is like something happening outside of ourselves 
And of course, there is something happening outside of ourselves, but how do we access it from within ourselves? Um, and I think that's the interesting place that artists actually have, you know, can play a role. Um, art, certainly in the West, has been looking inward, you know, the last few hundred years. It's become very reflective, right, and very kind of inward looking. And I think that was the romantic reaction to science looking outward and analyzing it and breaking it apart. And, you know, this is again kind of to, to our conversation this morning. We, we do have, it's, I think we can come back together in some sense. Um, the challenge to that is specialization, right? Science is so complex that you can't also be artists, full blown artists at the same time. Um, so we can work together, right? I also, I, it's too late for me to become a full blown scientist, right? Because there's so much to learn, there's so much history, there's so much involvement. So my, my understanding of it is that we, um, we should have a philosopher in the room, we should have an artist in the room, we should have scientists in the room, um, and we all have to then train ourselves into an openness that our specialties have, I think, trained us away from. Yeah. You mentioned this desirability of um, adjacency, sort of being near each other, and then also kind of uh, the idea of the studio becoming a lab, but, but what about that sort of idea of shared uh, facilities? Like if I'm thinking of the things that we do, we visualize as scientists, we have special techniques of looking at stuff, microscopes, macros, you know, telescopes, you know, different ways of seeing things at scales that aren't natural for us to see. And then we have ways of presenting stuff, visualization. And I feel like we don't, and then we, we all create stuff, we all ask stuff. So if you think of negotiating that inquiry, what is the question? Um, being able to make stuff, you know, like when we shared ability to use the same, you know, whatever 3D printer or, you know, laser cutter or like whatever it is that you're making stuff, you know, alchemy scenario, whatever it is. I mean, are we, is it beyond adjacency into like shared toolkit so that actually, you, have, you know, you're working at this with the same media, with the same images? Would that be, be you know, beyond just sitting next to each other? Yeah. So one of the, one of the implications of the narrative research, the film based research that I came upon almost right away was that the tools are insufficient. All right, all the tools that I use for filmmaking um, are made for making films that I put out into the world as like linear pieces of media. And then there's non-linear media like algorithmic editors that you can put on, on the web, but they're all product based, right? It's all about making a product and publishing it. So the first thing I started to think about is like, I, we need new tools for filmmakers. And then I started to imagine every artist is going to come, come up against this. If they, if they reframe their practice as not art making, but as knowledge production, they're going to need new tools. Scientists may, you may already have those tools. The thing is, I don't know. Um, or I know I need, I need technologists to help me build those tools. Um, so again, it's, you know, the technologists are kind of serving a market and the market tells them that they need Adobe Premiere to cut, you know, to cut a feature film. Um, I need a thing that makes this kind of map for me. I need to be able to kind of code things. So some of this stuff is actually based on social scientists tools, right? The concept of coding is a social science concept. Um, and there are social science pieces of software that let me kind of code text and highlight images. Um, so I can see in that, like the beginning of uh, coming into a science lab and being like, oh, I could use this, right? Artists are all about repurposing things. Um, so I could repurpose some of the tools that you're using, or maybe if we're adjacent to each other, we recognize that you need tools that artists have used. Um, and maybe we need hybrid tools. Um, I think that's like a third component that is, you know, kind of to be determined is, is if we created these kind of interdisciplinary, like really collaborative open sort of spaces, I think one of the first things that will emerge from them are an entirely new family of tools. My question is more about the data you are collecting from being an artist in another place because I come from Europe and there is already a lot of program going on for residencies, grants, putting collaboration sheets between artists and scientists. It's on now in Europe. Yeah. I'm part of different programs as well. And I'm here, obviously. <laughs> so the thing is more for me is like, uh, I'm not part of the, what you call the market, art market at all. Mm -hmm. I'm just like this, in between residencies and there is a lot of art centers that are on this kind of 
results, whatever it is. Uh, for me, the question is more about what the thing you were talking about, what's in between all the knowledge you get from the different kinds of sciences, and then you get this in a, your way that is very specific. And I think this is useful for other people. Mm -hmm. And we don't have the net, as you say. It's like pretty tough to share this, which is not the piece. It's not the time you are sharing, I mean, everyday life with a scientist, for instance, when you are in residency. What do you do from that? That's really my question now, today. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's a great question. So artist residencies, um, especially in the United States, are problematic, right? It, okay. Because, um, so if I get a year-long artist residency right now in, um, like in New York City, there are public artists in residencies, which this is like the most progressive program in the country, where you can spend a year in any city agency as an artist in residence. You get like $5,000 and a cubicle, right? Um, if I'm a scientist in residence, if I'm a demographer, right, in the demographics office, or if I'm, you know, if I'm a social scientist, you're going to get a salary. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so part of it is that. So on the one hand, it's like um, artists have. I mean, you know, we've been kind of tamed into accepting that as okay. And part of that is because we aren't really sure what our value is. Um, like, I'm going to go in there, and every artist. So I work specifically with artists in residence, so that. Um, so I'm their impact producer, okay? I do the coding on their audience texts, on their process texts, uh, on their producer texts, um, and on their artwork, and like draw the data out of it. And the artist is like, oh wow, I never saw, I never knew all this that was happening. And, and then we have to shape it to that agency or that organization. Maybe they, they want to report back, right? Everybody wants a deliverable, right? So that, that the deliverable of an artist residency tends to be like, decorations on the wall, like feel good events, and positive PR, okay? We're not a big evil bureaucracy, we have an artist in residence. Um, so, but if that artist in residence was producing data, was producing knowledge, right? Whether in the form of reports or artworks, standalone artworks on their own, um, knowledge in an audience, right? Experience with the public, um, that's really economically valuable that artists could do that full time and they could do it for a salary. That would change our culture. If artists were not in an, a state of economic desperation, where we are all best friends until we have to stab each other in the back to get the gallery show and then nobody likes you anymore, but now you're collected by you know, an oil tycoon. That's the reality artists face and that's where art schools are pointing them, right? Because that's like career services, is how do you get a gallery show? You know, how do you enter the market? instead of what do you do at a residency to prove your worth and to, and to transform that, that agency, right? Or that organization, wherever that residency is. Maybe part of the problem with that is the scientists that we have been trained in years to get the papers out, and we have place in university, and it's, it's something that's been used for a while over a week is the structure that we just live in the process. I just don't want to claim I know it because I don't firsthand. I've heard it. I've heard that, you know, before. And I just think ultimately, we ultimately capitalism is going to insist that we have deliverables, right? And, you know, for scientists, it's a career with papers. For artists, it's a career in a gallery. Um, and, but the, but the thing that unifies us is that all we want to do is learn, right? And, and build, and build a body of knowledge that we can pass on, right? We need an economy that values that for both of us. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.